Well, welcome to the second session of The Secrets of Pentecost. I'm very thankful that you're here. We have a very exciting topic to study today. Uh, the title is The First Fruits, and it's very closely related to the day of Pentecost. However, before we open God's Word, we want to ask for God's guidance. And so I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we come before your throne, recognizing our own ignorance, our lack of wisdom. Therefore, we need your wisdom. We need your intelligence from on high, because you know all things. So we ask that as we study this uh, topic about the first fruits, that your Holy Spirit will be with us to open our understanding and to open our hearts to receive that which you have for us. And we thank you, Father, for the privilege of approaching your throne in prayer. And we thank you for hearing us, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. It was the Sunday before the triumphal entry, uh, the Sunday of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. As Jesus had entered Jerusalem, a group of Greeks approached the apostle Philip. And they were hoping that Philip would use his influence to get them an appointment with Jesus. I'd like to read about that as it's found in John chapter 12 and verses 20 through 22. It says, Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. Now the reply of Jesus to this request was surprising because it seemed to be totally unrelated to the request that the Greeks made. Let's notice the reply of Jesus in John chapter 12 and verses 23 and 24. But Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Now, the answer of Jesus appears to be somewhat disjointed from the question that the Greeks had asked. What's happening here? Well, let me explain. The Greeks wanted an interview with Jesus because they were desirous of Jesus to go to Greece to uh, teach and to perform some of the works of healing that uh, he had performed in the Holy Land. And they wanted Jesus to come to their country. It just so happens that the answer of Jesus was very clear and very direct that his role was not to go to Greece at that time because he had his face steadfast towards Jerusalem. Jesus knew that he had to die. If he didn't die, then any preaching or any healing among the Greeks would be totally fruitless. You see, that grain of wheat was none other than Jesus Christ. And as the grain of wheat falls into the earth, the seed dies, and then it sprouts forth to life again. Jesus was going to die, He was going to go to the tomb, and then He was going to sprout up again, He was going to resurrect. And when Jesus resurrected as a result, then there would be much fruit among the Gentiles and among the Greeks. And so Jesus said, if I don't fall into the ground and die and sprout forth again in resurrection, I will remain a solitary grain of wheat. But if I fall into the earth and I die and I sprout forth to new life, then there will be much fruit, there will be many conversions to the truth. Now in order to understand what we're going to study today, we need to comprehend the spring feasts of the Hebrew calendar. There were four feasts that were celebrated in the spring in Israel. I'm going to review those in, uh, so that we have the context for what we're going to study in our topic today. The first feast was the Passover. And referring to the times of Christ, the Passover was fulfilled on the sixth day of the week. That is, on Friday, which was the 14th day of Nisan. Now, on the Passover, the lamb was slain. And of course, that represented the death of Christ on that very day. 
And then after this we have the next feast which is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread took place on Sabbath, the day after the Passover, with regards to Christ. Uh, the Unleavened Bread took place on the 15th day of Nisan, and basically the children of Israel ate unleavened bread. And the reason why is because in fulfillment the unleavened bread represented the body of Christ which had no sin. That's why the bread had no leaven. And then you have a third festival, which is the festival of the first fruits. That was fulfilled in Christ on Sunday morning. It was fulfilled on the 16th day of Nisan. Now in type a sheaf was taken and it was waved at the entrance of the sanctuary before the Lord. And of course that was fulfilled when Jesus ascended to heaven and He presented Himself before His Father on resurrection morning. And we're going to study all of these things in more detail, but I want you to have the picture now. And then after the sheep was waved before the Lord, a period of 50 days went by, and then you have what is known as the Feast of Pentecost. That's when the Holy Spirit was poured out. Now in type, that is in the ceremony that Israel had, on the day of Pentecost two loaves of bread leavened were presented as first fruits to the Lord. And so that we're going to notice represents the fact that when Jesus ascended to heaven He presented those who resurrected with Him and he also presented before his father the first fruits that were converted on the day of Pentecost, which were actually 3,000. Those are the two loaves of bread that were presented as the first fruits on the day of Pentecost. Now, let's review then the three feasts because they're extremely important for understanding what we're going to study. Passover, the 14th of Nisan on a Friday. Unleavened bread, the 15th of Nisan on a Sabbath. Uh, first fruits, the 16th of Nisan on the first day of the week or a Sunday. Fifty days later, Pentecost, when the two loaves of leavened bread were presented as the first fruits to the Lord on the Feast of Pentecost. So is that clear? Is the chronology clear? Now, let's study the first fruit ceremony that took place in the third festival of the Jewish year. We're referring now not to the Passover, not to unleavened bread, but to the festival that came after unleavened bread. Leviticus chapter 23 and verses 9 through 12 describes the way in which Israel celebrated this ceremony. And so let's notice Leviticus 23 and verses 9 through 12. It says there, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you enter the land I am going to give you, and you reap its harvest, now I want you to notice the elements, bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain of your harvest. He, that is the priest, is to wave the sheaf before the Lord so it will be accepted on your behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after the Sabbath. So we've read the passage, now let's review some of the details uh, that we find in this passage. First of all, the how uh, the Feast of First Fruits was celebrated. I'll explain it, it's very simple. The Israelites, each Israelite family, was, would cut the first fruits of the barley harvest in their own fields. Then they would take several stalks of the grain and they would put them together and formed a sheaf out of several stalks. Then each family would bring the stock to the sanctuary and they would give it to the priest. And then the priest would go to the entrance of the sanctuary building and he would wave this uh, sheaf of first fruits of barley before the Lord and then it was accepted in the sight of the Lord when it was waved before Him. So that's the how this ceremony uh, transpired in Israel. Now the question is, when did this ceremony take place? Well, as we read, it took place the day after the Sabbath. Now uh, there's some controversy even among Jewish scholars as to which Sabbath is referred to here. 
because the ceremonial Sabbath of unleavened bread was before the first fruits were offered, and the seventh day Sabbath uh, also could be meant by the Sabbath that was before the uh, sheaf was offered before the Lord. So the big question is, uh, was the sheaf waved before the Lord after the ceremonial Sabbath of unleavened bread, or was it waved before the Lord after the seventh day Sabbath? The text doesn't specify, it simply says that the priest is to wave it on the day after the Sabbath. Now I want you to just to keep this in mind, it's the day after the Sabbath. We have to determine whether it's the Sabbath of unleavened bread or whether it's the seventh day Sabbath, and we'll come back to that later. For now I just want you to remember that it's, it takes place after the Sabbath, whether ceremonial or moral. Now we need to ask the question, what time of the day were the first fruits offered or waved before the Lord? Now each feast, is impo it's important to realize, was fulfilled punctually. In other words, each feast was fulfilled not only as to the day, but also with regards to the hour. Now we know that Pentecost occurred exactly 50 days after the first fruits were waved before the Lord. That's important to know. The, the Pentecost, which was the fourth feast of the Hebrew year, took place 50 days precisely and exactly after the first fruits had been waved before the Lord. Now, we do know at what time the Feast of Pentecost was fulfilled. I want you to notice Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. We're going to actually work backwards. We're going to work from the Feast of Pentecost backwards to determine the hour at which the sheaf was waved before the Lord. Notice Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, that word fully really means to become completely full. In other words, the time was absolutely complete. The time for it to be fulfilled had passed. So it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now the question is, when was that moment when Pentecost had fully come, when the 50 days had been fully completed between the wave sheaf and the day of Pentecost? The answer is not hard to find. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 15, it tells us what time the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. It says there, uh, and you remember that on the day of Pentecost, uh, you know, some of the, those who were present, they thought that uh, those who were speaking in tongues were drunk. Do you remember that? And then Peter says, no, no, you guys are wrong. And notice how he explains it in Acts chapter 2 and verse 15. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. Now, which was the third hour of the day, biblically speaking? The third hour of the day is nine o'clock in the morning. The sixth hour is noon. The ninth hour, which is the hour that Jesus died, would be three o'clock in the afternoon. So in other words, Pentecost fully came at the third hour at nine o'clock in the morning. And now listen up. And first fruits were waved before the Lord exactly 50 days earlier. So at what time was the wave sheaf waved before the Lord? At nine o'clock in the morning. That's a very important detail we're going to notice. Now, the, the Feast of first fruits was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Jesus fulfilled the Passover because He was the Passover lamb. Jesus fulfilled the unleavened bread because His body had no leaven of sin, and therefore His body saw no corruption. And Jesus also fulfilled the first fruits ceremony. Now the question is, uh, when did Jesus fulfill this particular ceremony, the first fruits? We read that it was after the Sabbath that the first fruits were waved before the Lord. Now, whether it was the ceremonial Sabbath or the moral Sabbath doesn't make any difference whatsoever. Because we know that when Jesus was on this earth, the ceremonial Sabbath of unleavened bread fell the same day as the seventh day Sabbath. It was a high day. So it doesn't really make any difference whether it was at the Sabbath, uh, after the ceremonial Sabbath or after the Sabbath of the moral law because both of them would be true with regards to Christ. 
because the day after Passover was unleavened bread and that was a Sabbath and we know that Jesus rested in the tomb on the Sabbath and the next day was the day that he presented the wave sheaf. So we know that Jesus presented the wave sheaf on the day after the first Sabbath of unleavened bread on the day after the seventh day Sabbath. In other words, Jesus celebrated the wave sheaf the day of his resurrection. Now the question is, at what time did this happen? We've already noticed that it took place about nine o'clock in the morning. Now let's study a little bit about an encounter that Mary Magdalene had with Jesus in the garden the morning of the resurrection. Go with me to John chapter 20 and verse 17 and I am reading from uh, the New King James Version. As you remember when Jesus spoke to Mary in the garden Mary immediately recognized his voice and impulsively she wanted to do something which Jesus forbade her to do. Notice John 20 and verse 17. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. So notice Jesus is saying, do not cling to me or don't attach yourself to me because I haven't ascended to my Father yet. But then Jesus says, but uh, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father and to my God and to your God. Now I must say that most Bible versions contend that the expression, don't touch me, really should be translated don't cling to me. You see the King James Version says don't touch me, but most modern versions say don't cling to me. In other words, what these versions are saying is that Jesus is not forbidding Mary from touching him, he is forbidding Mary from clinging to him. Now the, the word that is used here is translated for example in the NIV in 35 of the 36 references uh, to this word in the New Testament, the NIV translates touch. This is the only verse where the NIV translates cling to. And so you would say, well, the translation cling to is a wrong translation. Well, we have to take a look at that. Now, let me give you some examples from the New Testament of how this word uh, is used by the NIV to refer simply to touching and not to clinging. Uh, you remember that Jesus touched a leper? This is found in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 3. Jesus obviously did not cling to the leper. Jesus touched the leper. Uh, we also have the case of the woman that touched Christ's garment. Did she cling to his garment? No, she touched his garment. In fact, she didn't cling to it because Jesus looked back to see who had touched it and, and she wasn't clinging to it anymore. Also, the Bible uses this word, the NIV uses this word, uh, to refer to the multitude that wanted to touch Jesus when they surrounded him. It's also used in the NIV to describe parents who wanted Jesus to touch their children. And of course that's found in Luke chapter 18 and verse 15. And then it's used also to refer to Jesus touching the eyes of the blind. Obviously it's not referring to Jesus clinging to the eyes of the blind. He's touching the eyes of the blind. And so in 35 or 36 references to this word uh, in the New Testament in the NIV, it is translated touch. Only in John 20, 17 is it translated cling to. Now, is that a correct way of proceeding? I believe that it is. Let me tell you the reason why. I went to the lexicons, which are the dictionaries that uh, define Greek words, and I discovered that the word hapto that is used here, uh, even though it's translated touch most of the times in the New Testament, its lexical meaning is to fasten to, to adhere to or to cling to. That is the dictionary definition of the word in Greek. Now the question is, why would Jesus say to Mary, don't cling to me because I have not yet ascended to my Father, if he was not going to ascend to his Father until 40 days later? Are you understanding my question? Clinging, him to, clinging to him in the garden for a few minutes would certainly not have detained him from ascending to his father 40 days later. So why would Jesus say to Mary, don't cling to me because I have not yet ascended to my father? There has to be 
a deeper reason than just touching here. Jesus is saying, don't cling to me, I have not yet ascended to my Father. Now another interesting detail that we find here is the verb tense of the word ascend. Did you notice that Jesus said, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father? Notice he doesn't say, I will ascend to my Father and to your Father. He says, I am ascending to your Father and to my Father. If Jesus had meant to say that 40 days later he was going to ascend to his Father, it would have been very easy to say, I will ascend to my Father. But the verb is a first person, indicative, active tense, which means it is present. Jesus is saying, I am practically saying, now ascending to my Father. In fact, the ESV, the English Standard Version, translates it, I am ascending. The New International Version translates it, I am returning. And the New American Standard Bible translates it, I ascend. All of them are in present. So Jesus is telling Mary, I am ascending to my Father. Now what was Jesus saying to Mary? What Jesus was saying to Mary was this, don't cling to me. Don't hold me back right now because I must now ascend to my Father. You see, precisely at nine o'clock in the morning, on resurrection morning, at the sanctuary, at the entrance to the sanctuary, the priest was going to wave the sheaf before the Lord in fulfillment of the wave sheaf ceremony. And at that very hour, in fulfillment of the wave sheaf, Jesus had to be in heaven at the entrance of the sanctuary presenting himself as the first fruits before his father. And Mary might detain him or cling to him and hold him back. So Jesus says, don't hold me back. I am ascending to my father. Ellen White says in Great Controversy 399, speaking about the feasts, these types were fulfilled not only as to event, but as to the time. In other words, the timing of the feasts were also fulfilled specifically by Jesus. Now, praise the Lord that Ellen White spoke about this journey of Jesus to heaven on resurrection morning to present himself as the first fruits. I want to read from early writings, pages 187 and 188, where Ellen White describes this quick trip to heaven on resurrection morning. Of course, he came back the same day we know. This is what she says. Page 187 and 188. Jesus spoke to her with his own heavenly voice saying, Mary, she was acquainted with the tones of that dear voice and quickly answered, Master, and in her joy was about to embrace him. See, it's more than touching, was about to embrace him. But Jesus said, Touch me not, for I, have, I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. Joyfully she hastened to the disciples with the good news. Now listen to this. Jesus quickly ascended to his Father, and he did it for two reasons. Notice the two reasons. He quickly ascended to his Father, number one, to hear from his lips that he accepted the sacrifice. Remember that the reason for waving the sheaf was that it would be accepted before the Lord? And so Jesus is that sheaf. And so uh, to hear from his lips that he accepted the sacrifice, and then secondly, this is very important, to receive all power in heaven and on earth. So Jesus went for two reasons, to make sure that his sacrifice was accepted by the Father, and secondly, so that he could uh, make sure that his Father would give him all power. So Jesus went on resurrection morning to receive all power from his Father. Now I want you to notice Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19. This is very interesting. Uh, this is taking place on the Mount of Olives right before the ascension of Christ. And we're not talking about His ascension on, the, uh, on resurrection morning, we're talking about His ascension 40 days later. So Matthew 20, 28 and verse 19 is referring to His ascent to heaven 40 days later. Now I want you to notice what Jesus said to His disciples right before His departure. He said, all power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Let me ask you, before Jesus ascended, had he received all power from his Father? 
Yes, he had. He's saying so here. He hasn't ascended here yet. He has not ascended yet. And he's saying to the disciples, all power has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Not will be given when I get to heaven, but has been given to me. Let me ask you, when did the Father give it to him? We just read it from the Spirit of Prophecy. It was given to him when he ascended to heaven on resurrection morning. Are you with me or not? Now, let's finish reading this statement from Ellen White. Incidentally, that verb, all power has been given to me, is an indicative passive aorist. The aorist tense in Greek is past. There's no doubt that Jesus is saying, I have already received power from my Father before He ascended to heaven, because He had received it in His first ascent to heaven, the morning of the resurrection. Now let's complete Ellen White's statement about the ascension, the quick ascension of Christ on the first day of the week. It says there, angels like a cloud surrounded the Son of God and bade the everlasting gates be lifted up, that the King of glory might come in. I saw that while Jesus was with that bright host, in the heavenly host, in the presence of God, and surrounded by His glory, now listen carefully, He did not forget His disciples upon the earth, but received power from His Father, that He might return and impart power to them. Now you say, but he didn't give them power until the day of Pentecost. Oh yes, he did. You remember when Jesus appeared to them uh, th that he breathed upon them the Holy Spirit? This is before the day of Pentecost. And so they did receive power from Christ before the day of Pentecost. And so once again, we go here to the conclusion of the statement where she says, uh, he did not forget his disciples upon the earth, but received power from his Father, this is resurrection morning, that he might return and impart power to them. And then she says, the same day he returned and showed himself to his disciples. He suffered them then to touch him, for he had ascended to his Father and had received power. Is that clear? It's amazing how Ellen White is always so much in harmony with Scripture. Now I want to read Ellen White's explanation of the wave sheet ceremony and what it meant. The pre presentation of Jesus at the door of the tabernacle in heaven, the door of the temple in heaven as the first fruits. It has a special meaning. Notice Desire of Ages, pages 785 and 786, and then we're going to show that Ellen White is in perfect harmony with the Bible. Notice, Christ arose from the dead as the first fruits of those who slept. He was the anti-type of the wave sheaf. See, there it is. He was the anti-type or the fulfillment of the wave sheaf. And His resurrection took place on the very day when the wave sheaf was to be presented before the Lord. For more than a thousand years this symbolic ceremony had been performed. From the harvest fields the first heads of ripened grain were gathered, and when the people went up to Jerusalem to the Passover, the sheaf of first fruits was waved as a thank offering before the Lord. Not until this was presented could the sickle be put to the grain and it be gathered into sheaves. The sheaf dedicated to God represented the harvest. So Christ, the first fruits, represented the great spiritual harvest to be gathered for the kingdom of God. In other words, when Jesus appeared before His Father, that was a little sample that the one who resurrected from the dead someday will resurrect all of the dead, all of those who, that have died in Jesus Christ. In other words, when Jesus presented Himself before His Father as the wave sheaf, that one sheaf from the field, the first fruits, Jesus was saying there are going to be lots of last fruits. There's going to be an abundant harvest of those who have died in Christ. Now the Apostle Paul agreed with Ellen White, or perhaps I should say Ellen White agreed with the Apostle Paul because she wrote after he did. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20. Here the Apostle Paul, first of all, tells us that Jesus fulfilled the first fruit ceremony or the wave sheaf ceremony. This is how he ex expresses it. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So is Christ the first fruits according to the Apostle Paul? Is his resurrection related to the first fruits? Absolutely. 
But there's another interesting detail. Ellen White says that Jesus presenting himself as the first fruits was a little sample of the great harvest of God's people at the end of time, those who have died in Christ. The Apostle Paul says the same. Notice what we find in 1 Corinthians 15, 22 and 23. For as in Adam all died, even so in Christ all shall be made alive, but each one in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ's at his coming. So you see Christ the first fruits, and then the, the last fruits come when? When Jesus comes at his coming. And so Ellen White certainly was in agreement with the Apostle Paul that the first fruits ceremony was fulfilled in Christ and that it represented the great harvest of the last fruits at the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice that there were also first fruits offered to the Lord on the day of Pentecost. Now we're talking about 50 days after the wave sheaf was waved before the Lord on resurrection morning. Fifty days later, on the day of Pentecost, there were also first fruits offered to the Lord. Those are the two festivals where you have first fruits offered before the Lord. So let's examine uh, the, the prophecy that we find in the Old Testament about the first fruits that were offered on the day of Pentecost. It's found in Leviticus 23 and verses 15 through 18. Leviticus 23 and verses 15 through 18. It says, And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, you remember that's the first fruit ceremony, it took place the day after the Sabbath, in other words, from that moment, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Count fifty days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. So in other words, after the wave sheaf was waved before the Lord, fifty days to the very day were supposed to pass. And then it continues saying in verse 16, count fifty days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwellings, now notice this, two wave loaves, so two loaves of bread, of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour, they shall be baked with leaven. So notice the two loaves of bread that were presented were with leaven, and then it says, they are the what? The first fruits to the Lord. The two loaves were the first fruits to the Lord. And the loaves were what? The loaves had leaven. Now this is interesting, because at Passover the bread could have no leaven. But at Pentecost the two loaves were to have leaven. So what could this possibly mean? Well, let's go to Matthew 13 and verse 33 which is the parable of the leaven that Jesus told, Matthew 13 and verse 33. And I want you to notice that we're dealing with two symbols here uh, in, in this ceremony, in this uh, ceremony where you have the two loaves that are presented before the Lord. You have first of all a loaf, and secondly you have the leaven in the loaf, two symbols. And we need to determine what those two symbols represent or mean. Matthew 13 verse 33 says, And another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like what? Like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal to make what? To make a loaf of bread, right? So it says, uh, she hid in three measures of meal till it was all what? Till it was all leaven. So you have a lump of dough, and inside the dough you have what? You have leaven. Now, immediately to your mind comes the idea well, in the Bible, leaven represents sin. So how can you have these, these loaves of bread offered before the Lord with leaven? You're offering something sinful. Well, it is true that the loaves, the, the, that the bread could not have leaven at the Passover. But that's not true of Pentecost. Now let's examine the bread that was used at Passover. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 6 through 8. Now we're going back, we're talking about Passover, we're, we're backtracking, we're not talking about what happened at Pentecost, because I want to clarify in your mind why at the Feast of Passover you have bread without leaven, and at Pentecost you have two loaves with leaven. Now notice 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. Paul says to the Corinthians, Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? 
and of course the lump represents the Corinthian church. So he says a little leaven leavens the whole lump, the whole church. Therefore he says purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, that you may be a new lump. So the Corinthian church is the lump of dough. Since you, he says once again, truly are unleavened, for indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Verse 8, therefore let us keep the feast, that is the Passover on unleavened bread, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So what is Paul telling the Corinthian church? He's telling the Corinthian church, you are the bread dough, and you are to not have any leaven within yourselves. In other words, you cannot allow the leaven of wickedness to be put inside the church. And so you say, well, if the leaven can't be put inside the dough, which represents the church, then how is it that you have two loaves of, dough, uh, of bread on the day of Pentecost with leaven? Does this mean then that the church is being presented full of sin to the Lord? The answer is no. You see, every symbol has to be interpreted within its own context. Let me take, for example, a lion. What does a lion represent in Scripture? Can a lion represent Christ? Yes. 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 Can it represent the devil? Yes. Sure, he goes as a roaring lion. Can it represent Babylon? Yes. Can it represent Judah, the son of Jacob? So does lion always mean the same thing? No. You have to take into account the context. So just because at Passover the leaven in the bread represented sin, doesn't mean that in the Feast of Pentecost leaven represents the same thing. You see at Pentecost leaven in the two loaves of dough represents something totally different. In other words we have to take into account the context. Are you following me or not? Now I want to read you a statement from Ellen White which is very interesting. We're going to find here that the lump of dough at Pentecost that formed these loaves of bread represents the church. And the leaven doesn't represent sin, the leaven represents the Holy Spirit that is placed inside the church. So leaven can represent sin, but it can also represent the implanting of the Holy Spirit, which was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Let me read you this significant statement from Ellen White. It's found in Christ's Object Lessons, pages 96 and 97. But in the Savior's parable, leaven is used to represent the kingdom of heaven. It illustrates the quickening, assimilating power of the grace of God. None are, not, none are so vile, none have fallen so low as to be beyond the working of this power. In, now notice this, in all who would submit themselves to what? Ah, there it is, to the Holy Spirit, a new principle of life is to be what? Just like the leaven is implanted in the dough, to be implanted. The lost image of God is to be restored in humanity. She continues saying, But man cannot transform himself by the exercise of his will. He possesses no power by which this change can be effected. The leaven, something holy from without, must be put into the meal before the desired change can be wrought in it. So the grace of God must be received by the sinner before he can be fitted for the kingdom of glory. All the culture and education which the world can give will fail of making a degraded child of, si child of sin a child of heaven. The renewing energy must come from God. The change can be made only by the Holy Spirit. All who would be saved, high or low, rich or poor, must submit to the working of this power. And so on the day of Pentecost, the, the loaves of bread represent the church, and the leaven in the dough represents the implantation of the power of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. Now you say, Pastor Bohr, but why do you have two loaves of leavened bread? Don't we have just one church? Why not just one loaf? Why two loaves on the day of Pentecost? The reason is because on the day of Pentecost you had two groups of first fruits. And now we're going to take a look at the first group of first fruits that were offered on the day of Pentecost. Let's go in our Bibles to Matthew 27 and verses 51 to 53. Matthew 27 and verses 51 
to 53. We're going to see why there are two loaves. It's not that you have two churches on the day of Pentecost who have the Holy Spirit in them. No, you have two groups that are the first fruits on the day of Pentecost, but they both belong to the same church. Matthew 27, 51 to 53. This is when Jesus has just died. I want you to notice what happened. It says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And now notice this, And coming out of the graves after His resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. And so you have this group of individuals that resurrected with Jesus Christ. Now, what happened with these individuals? The Bible doesn't directly address it, although we're going to find that the Apostle Paul has some strong uh, language that will help us understand who they were. The spirit of prophecy has no doubts as to who they were and what eventually happened to them. Notice Desire of Ages, page 829. It's speaking about the moment for the ascension of Christ. The time had come for Christ to ascend to His Father's throne. As a divine conqueror, because he had been in a battle, right? Remember our first study, uh, the return of the war hero? He had, did battle with the devil and then he returned victorious to heaven. We studied about that. So it says, as a divine conqueror, he was about to return with what? With the trophies of victory to the heavenly courts. The trophies of his victory were those who resurrected with him. In Desire of Ages, page 786, Ellen White identifies who these people were, not by name, but by category. Notice Desire of Ages 786. They were those who had been co-laborers with God, and who, at the cost of their lives, had borne testimony to the truth. Now they were to be witnesses for Him who had raised them from the dead. In other words, those who the devil had persecuted to the point of death, now Jesus resurrects them and He takes them away from the enemy. What a wonderful thought that those who fell under the power of the devil through persecution, through Him killing them, are the very ones that now resurrect along with Jesus Christ. Now, what is the message of the wave sheet at the Feast of Pentecost? In Desire of Ages, pages 833 and 834, we find that when Jesus ascended to heaven, He ascended with those who resurrected with Him. They were a small sampling, the first fruits of the great harvest that will come forth from the grave at the coming of Christ. Notice how Ellen White describes it in Desire of Ages, pages 833 and 834. This is when Jesus has ascended to heaven, there's great acclamation, the angels and the heavenly beings are singing, they're having a great time because the war here is coming back, and then Jesus waves them all back. And notice how it continues here. But He waves them back. Not yet. He cannot not, not now receive the coronet of glory and the royal robe. He enters into the presence of His Father. He points to His wounded head, the pierced side, the marred feet, he lifts his hands bearing the print of the nails. He points, now listen carefully, to the tokens of his triumph. He presents to God the wave sheaf, those raised with him as representatives of that great multitude who shall come forth from the grave at his second coming. You see, on resurrection morning, Jesus presented himself before the Father as the first fruits, but he says, now somebody might get the wrong impression that there's not going to be others there too. So now he takes a group of martyrs who have resurrected with him. He says, here's the little sampling from the human race that is going to resurrect as a sign of the great resurrection at the end of time. Now the Apostle Paul had something very specific about to, uh, about, to say about the feast of Pentecost and the first fruits. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4 and verses 7 through 13. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 7 to 13 and we'll move through this quickly because our time is very brief. Here the Apostle Paul is speaking about spiritual gifts. You remember when Jesus went to heaven he gave the gift of the Holy Spirit and with the Holy Spirit come the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Remember the gifts of the Holy Spirit? You know, like apostles, prophets, uh, healings, tongues, all of those gifts that come when they receive the Holy Spirit. Now the Apostle Paul is speaking about the moment when those gifts were given. And I want you to notice the details here. 
Ephesians chapter 4, 7 to 13, and you have explanatory notes there in brackets. But to each one of us, grace, the Greek word is charis, from where we get the word charismata, which is the word gifts in the New Testament. But to each one of us, grace was what? Was given according to the measure of Christ's what? Gift. So we have received grace from God because we have received what? Because we have received the gift from Christ. Now what is the gift that Christ gave? Christ gave the Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus referred to this in Luke 11 verse 13 where He said, if you parents know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give you the gift of the Holy Spirit? It's the very same word. And so this is speaking about the gift of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Now let's continue reading, verse 8. Therefore, He says, because He has given this gift, He says, when He, that is when Jesus, what? Ascended on high, what event is that describing? The ascension of Christ, right? When He ascended on high, He led captivity captive. What does that mean, He led captive? Who was captive in the graves at that time? Ah, those who had resurrected with Him, they had been captive in the grave, and now Jesus took them out, and He takes captivity captive. So it says, uh, when He ascended on high, He led cap. notice it doesn't say He took, it says He led, He's the war hero, He led captivity captive, and what did He do when He led captivity captive? When He presented that wave sheaf before the Lord, what did He do on the day of Pentecost? He gave what? He gave gifts to men, which are the gifts of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Verse 9, now this, He ascended, what does it mean? But that He also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended, it's talking about His his death and His burial, He who descended is also the one who what? Who ascended, is it talking about His ascension? Is that when He took captivity captive? Is that when He gave gifts to men? Absolutely. So notice it continues saying here, Uh, In verse 10, He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that He might fill all things. And then it speaks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It says, He Himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, and then it gives us the reason why God gave these gifts, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So let's summarize what we've seen from this passage. First of all, do we have a clear allusion to the death and burial of Christ, yes or no? Absolutely. Do we have a clear reference to the ascension of Christ? Absolutely. The expression when He ascended is used twice in this passage. Do we have a reference to Him taking captivity captive when He ascended to heaven? Absolutely. Do we have a reference to Him giving the gift and giving the gifts? This passage is talking about the day of Pentecost. It's talking about when Jesus presented Himself as the wave sheaf. Now, we need to understand, and this is very important, that the background of Ephesians 4 is Psalm 68. Now, Psalm 68 is a very interesting psalm. It's talking about the victory of God over His enemies, and now God is in a procession back to Mount Zion in Jerusalem, victorious amidst the acclamations of His people. And of course, that's symbolic of the victory of Christ over the devil and over his enemies and his procession to heaven, to the heavenly Zion, victorious as the war hero. Now I want you to notice Psalm 68 and verse 1. Psalm 68 is quoted by the Apostle Paul when it says, He took captivity captive and gave gifts to men. This comes from Psalm 68 verse 18. It's a quotation. So we know that Psalm 68 has to be connected with uh, this passage in Ephesians 4. And So it says in verse 1, Let God arise, let His enemies be scattered, let those who hate Him flee before Him. See, this is the the victory of God in battle. And then I want you to notice verse 4. He's returning from the battlefield on the clouds to the holy place, and there's a procession where they're, they're praising this victor that is coming back to Jerusalem. It says there in verse 4, Sing to God, 
sing praises to his name, extol him who what? Who rides on the clouds, his name, notice the emphasis on the name, his name is Yah, that means the Lord, that's Yahweh or Jehovah, and rejoice before him. So he's coming back and there's rejoicing and his name is being proclaimed. You know, this reminds me of Psalm 24. Do you remember that we studied in our first uh, topic about the return of the war hero and how the angels were singing Psalm 24? Let me just read verses 8 and 9. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. This is what the angels were singing as Jesus approached the holy city at His ascension. And then those angels who are waiting inside say, Who is this King of glory? And the answer comes from those who are escorting Jesus, The Lord, that's the same name, Yahweh, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. So you see, Jesus has been in a battle, He's mighty in battle, He's coming back, and the people are rejoicing. Ellen White describes this in Desire of Ages, page 833. She says, All heaven was waiting to welcome the Savior to the celestial courts. As He ascended, He led the way, and the multitude of captives, notice the word captives, the multitude of captives set free at His resurrection followed. The heavenly host with shouts and acclamations of praise and celestial song attended the joyous train. And so this, is talk, this psalm is about the ascension, the victorious ascension of Christ to heaven after He's defeated His enemies and the heavenly beings are singing as he, He's approaching the holy city. Notice verse 11 of Psalm 68. It says, The Lord gave the word. Great was the company of those who proclaimed it. In other words, God commanded the multitudes to proclaim Him and to acclaim Him King. Now do you know it's very interesting that there are some that are using this text in favor of the ordination of women. Totally out of context because uh, what, they, what uh, one pastor says is, well you know, uh, this text is really saying in, in verse 11 that the women after the resurrection of Jesus, they went and proclaimed the resurrection of Christ and therefore because they were the first ones to proclaim the, uh, the, the resurrection of Christ, then they are supposed to be ordained and they're supposed to be preachers. Now that is a, that is a humongous stretch. Because the text is not talking about the resurrection of Christ, it's talking about His procession to heaven 40 days later. It's not talking at all about the day of His resurrection, it's talking about the day of His ascension in the midst of acclamations. To, say, to, to sidetrack the issue to say that these are the women that are proclaiming the resurrection of Christ does not fit the context of what the Apostle Paul is trying to say and what the psalmist has to say as well. Notice uh, Psalm 68 and verse 17. This is the very verse before the verse that, uh, that the Apostle Paul quotes. Psalm 68 and verse 17. God has come with ten, tens of thousands of His chariots. He has come with thousands and thousands of them. Who are those? Angels, folks. And then it says, the Lord has come from Mount Sinai, because the original context has to do with Israel. The Lord has come from Mount Sinai, and He has entered what? His holy place. So where did Jesus enter when He went to heaven? He entered the holy place. This has nothing to do with His resurrection. This has to do with His procession after Jesus is ascending to heaven. Notice verse 24. I'm reading from the New International Version. It says, speaking about this procession, it says, Your procession has come into view, O God. The procession of my God and King into, his, into what? Into the sanctuary. What is He doing? He's coming into the sanctuary, the heavenly sanctuary at His ascension. And then of course you have verse 35 of Psalm 68, which is very significant. It says, O God, You are more awesome than Your holy places. The God of Israel is He who gives strength and power to His people. What did God do on the day of Pentecost? He gave what? He gave strength and power to whom? He gave strength and power to His people. So the first loaf represents those first fruits that Jesus presented on the day of Pentecost. But there's another loaf. That other loaf represents the first fruits of the preaching of the gospel on the day of Pentecost. Notice Acts 2, verses 37 to 39. Peter has preached his sermon. Those who are present now come to Peter. They've been cut to the heart, and they say to Peter, what, what do we do in the light of what you've preached? Notice Peter says in verse 38, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
And the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41 that 3,000 first fruits of the gospel were converted to the Lord and were baptized. It says there, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And by the way, verse 47 says that they were added to the church. The second loaf represents the church, the first fruits of the church. And the first loaf represents the first fruits of those who resurrected with Jesus Christ. Now what is the good news of all of this? The good news, folks, is that all of this that took place with the first fruits, the day of the resurrection, and the first fruits on the day of Pentecost were only small scale down payments of the great harvest at the end of time. Let's read as we conclude. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18, where you have the final fulfillment, where all of the last fruits are now going to be harvested, and all of God's people will be together. Do you think Jesus is going to lose his down payment? No. Uh, he's not going to lose his down payment. He says, I'm just giving you this little down payment so you can be sure that the rest is going to be paid for, that everybody else is going to be there. Notice 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Then finally the fulfillment of what was taught by the first fruits will take place. And God's people, all of them from all ages and all nations, kindred, tongues, and people will all be together in the kingdom. And by the way, that celebration is the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles was a feast of joy where all of God's people gathered together and there was lots of singing and there were palm leaves and it was a time of rejoicing. Sin had been eradicated and now people were at peace and full of joy in the presence of the Lord. Aren't we looking forward to that day? I'm looking forward to it with great anticipation. And these ceremonies show us that it's not wishful thinking because what Jesus has done is an indication of what He will soon do.